Hey everyone, welcome back to Truth Unchained Ministries. My name is Tony Phillips, and this is where we help you learn to study the Bible for yourself. As we've seen in previous videos, there have been over 250 versions of the Bible that have come out since 1900. Now, where did all of these come from? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. We are going to look at the origin of all of these modern versions. And it all started with, appropriately titled, the Revised Version, also sometimes known as the English Revised Version. So this Revised Version was marketed to the American public and parts of England as an updated, hence the term revised, version of the Bible that was based on more accurate and more trustworthy Greek manuscripts. Now these Greek manuscripts were not the Texas Receptus, which came from Antioch, Syria. And as you know from the book of Acts, that was where the disciples were first called Christians. These more accurate and trustworthy Greek manuscripts were the Vaticanus Sinaiticus and Alexandrian texts. So a committee was put together and it was comprised of British and American scholars. And what they did was they took the works of Westcott and Hort as the source of inspiration for their updated Bible, because as I said, this was a Bible that was marketed as more accurate, more reliable. As with any translation, you must look at who is responsible for that. So back in 1881, you had just a New Testament produced. 1884, you had a full RV Bible, revised version, complete with the Old Testament. And then 1894, you had a complete Bible with the additional Catholic Apocrypha that was published and sold to the masses. And all of this was because of the works of Westcott and Hort. And we need to dive into those two men because if you don't understand who these men were and what they believed, you will not understand where all of these modern Bibles came from. So Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort, which I'll just say Westcott and Hort, because I don't feel like using their full names because they're quite long. They were the ones that, as, as I just stated, were the inspiration for not only the revised version, but every single modern Bible in production up to today. So that's over 141 years of their work continuing on to this day. They first published a Greek New Testament that was based off of the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus Greek manuscripts. They intentionally omitted the Textus Receptus, and they were open about that in their works. They blatantly say that they omitted the Textus Receptus, so it's not any sort of conspiracy theory. It, it was openly admitted by them. So I'm going to post on the screen here these quotes from Westcott and Hort with their sources, and I encourage you to find these books. They're easily accessible. You can get them on Kindle for dirt cheap and other places. And look at these quotes for yourself, and you'll see that I'm not taking anything out of context or twisting any terms, any words that they use, no paraphrasing, nothing, just exactly what they say in these works. And these are direct quotes from Westcott and Hort to give you a mindset of their decisions and what influenced their translations and just who these men were. What did they believe? So let's take a look at those. I reject the infallibility of Holy Scriptures overwhelmingly. Our Bible, as well as our faith, is a mere compromise. Westcott. Hell is not the place of punishment of the guilty. It is the common abode of departed spirits. Westcott. He also said, No one now, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example, give a literal history. I could never understand how anyone reading them with open eyes could think as they did. 
report said, but the book which has most engaged me is Darwin. Whatever may be thought of it, it is a book that one is proud to be contemporary with. My feeling is strong that the theory is unanswerable. Hort also said, I have been persuaded for many years that Mary worship and Jesus worship have much in common. Finally, Hort said, the popular doctrine of substitution is an immoral and material counterfeit. Nothing can be more unscriptural than the limiting of Christ bearing our sins and sufferings to his death. But indeed, that is only one aspect of an almost universal heresy. Take a moment and let their words sink in. They did not believe hell was where a sinner goes when they're lost without faith in Christ alone. They did not believe that there is a difference between Catholicism and Christianity. They did not believe that Genesis was a literal account of our earth, solar system, mankind. They liked Darwin. Faith is a compromise. The Bible, it's not infallible. That's what these men believed. So when they chose to put out a superior Greek translation, is it any wonder they omitted the complete Textus Receptus? Is it any wonder that they stripped the Lord of his deity, removed Christ's words, created contradictions in the Bible, and we're going to look at those that have found their way into every single modern version of the Bible on the market today. As we go through these revised version verses, you're going to see how they are nearly identical to what you'll read in the ESV. New King James that we looked at in the previous video. RSV. New World Translation, New Living Translation, all these modern Bibles, because they all stem from the Revised Version, which stems from the works of Westcott and Hort. So let's look at these Bible verses. So the first verse we're going to look at is found in the book of Luke. Luke 23, 42, Revised Version. And he said, Jesus Remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. What does the King James say? Remember what we've looked at in the entire foundation of, of this study is who gives Christ the preeminence? What gives Christ the preeminence? Is it the King James Bible? Is it every Bible? Well, look at what the King James says in the same verse. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The removal of the Lord's title, his deity being stripped away, goes back 141 years. All the way back to 1881. That is stripping Christ of his preeminence. That's not glorifying God at all. Let's continue and look at other verses. Luke 4, verses 3-4. through 4. And Jesus said unto him, If thou art the Son of God, command this stone, that it become bread. And Jesus answered unto him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And that verse ends in a period. We often teach our kids, and we tell others to put yourself in their shoes. Imagine how they would feel. But also ask how you would feel if somebody was quoting you, quoting you but they only quoted half of you wouldn't you be upset don't we tell people not to twist our words don't we tell people to give the whole story and yet it's somehow acceptable in modern versions when they take away Christ's words Look at what the King James says, same verses. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone 
that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, The man shall not live by bread alone, comma, but by every word of God. See, if you don't believe that the Bible is infallible, if you don't believe that it's better than, Dor than Darwin's origin of species, if, if you just put it as, you can't take it literally, it's just a work, then you have no problem with removing verses. You have no problem with changing characters who they are. It's just Jesus. It's not the Lord Jesus. You don't need to live by the word of God. It is, nah, you don't need that. Just man does not live by bread alone. Remember, a revision, by definition, you're editing. What do you do when you edit something? When I edit these videos, you don't get the full video. I cut out <laughs> a lot of it. Gaps where I'm just staring at the camera because I'm thinking about what I'm saying. Um, I, I do reshoots, etc. When you edit a book, what do you do? You go through and you remove parts of it. You make it easier to read. But when you're editing, the whole focus is to get sales. You edit to make something more pleasing. That's the whole point of editing. When you edit a paper in college, you, you don't send in your first draft. You've got a rough draft edited to a final draft in the hopes of your professor will give you an A because they like it. That's the whole point of editing. Make something more likable. These men that started every single modern Bible Bible had no problems editing God's word because they didn't have any fear of God's word. They didn't have any respect for God's word. They were two unsaved men that said worshiping Mary is the same as worshiping Jesus. Eh, it's all the same. Evolution? Sure. That's fine. That's much more believable that a Tyrannosaurus Rex turned into a chicken. That's far more believable than we have a creator. That's what these two men did. That's who they were. So they had no problem editing God's word. And that's what you see in most churches today, sadly. But they didn't just limit God's word to removing Christ's words. They also removed the Apostle Paul's words. So it, it didn't matter who it was. Everyone was equal, on equal ground when it came to their editing. Let's look at the book of Acts to find an example of this. Acts 9, 3 through 6. And as he journeyed, it came to pass that he drew nigh into Damascus, and suddenly there shone round about him a light out of heaven, and he fell upon the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise, and enter into the city, and thou shalt be told thee what thou must do. Doesn't seem like much. It's pretty long. We've got verses 3 through 6 there. But pay attention to King James, and see what's removed. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. They stripped away Paul's words. Paul was freaking out what was going on. And he asked the Lord Jesus Christ, What would you have me do? Gone. Notice here, And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. 
RV. King James said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. Once again, stripping away our Savior of his title, of his deity. Why do that? If you're going to edit, if you're going to revise, unless there's something satanic behind it, why in the world would you come up with a logical explanation for stripping Jesus Christ's words and his deity? Why? There's no logical explanation. Contradictions were also introduced. And we're going to look at the same contradiction, one of the same contradictions that we discovered in the New King James. And it all started 141 years ago in the RV. So let's look at the contradiction found in Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3.16 For who, when they heard, did provoke? Nay, did not all they that came out of Egypt by Moses? We looked at last time, no, not everyone rebelled. Joshua and Caleb did not rebel. They entered into the promised land. So you've got a contradiction right there. That's easily verifiable. Just read Exodus through Deuteronomy. King James gets it right. Same verse. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. True. Not everyone did rebel against Moses. So you have contradictions, removal of the Lord's words, and stripping away our Lord's title and deity. All started by Westcott and Hort. And you look at the revised version and just compare them to the modern versions. You'll find the verses are nearly identical. Whether it's the ESV, recommended by Liberty University, New King James, recommended by a lot of seminaries. Um, you've got the NASB, recommended by Bob Jones University. It doesn't matter because they're all perversions. But they're subtle changes sometimes dropping one word, sometimes removing part of a sentence. Satan is subtle and he's crafty. The Bible says that he deceived Eve with subtlety. Don't take this lightly. You have to understand that the revised version deceived the Prince of Preachers, as he's often called, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. It deceived amazing godly men like Oswald Chambers. They switched from the King James Bible, the truth, to the revised version. You might be wondering, well, how do I know the difference between the two? Between the right version of the Bible and the wrong version? 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us to study. When you study, it's not just the Bible. You better know the Bible, and it better be your foundation. But study what's going on in your culture. Remember, Paul, in his writings, he quoted the poets of the day. He studied, he surveyed the area around him, and he used that in his witnessing. When he and Barnabas were exalted as gods in the book of Acts, when they went to different cities and they saw an, an, an inscription saying to the unknown God, they studied, they surveyed the area around them so they could point out the truth of God's word, the truth of Jesus Christ, and what is false with their te other teachings, the, that culture, with their false religion, idolatry, etc., their writings. If you don't know church history, Bible history, then you're not studying, and you should, because you need to build your faith, and it's a command. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing 
the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. That's the mission statement of Truth Unchained. That's the founding verse for this whole ministry, the truth. And it shouldn't surprise you that there's only one version of the Bible that's accepted by God, that pleases God, and glorifies God. You have to think about that. Enoch was the only one on earth that walked with God. He was raptured. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. John 14, 6. That article is definitive, singular. There's only one truth, only one way to heaven. There's only one church. There's only one body of Christ. There's only one Bible, and that's the King James Bible. That's how God works. Singular, focused. That's what he does. That's what you find throughout scripture. One message. Only one way to go to heaven, and that's through the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It's not by faith and works. It's not by works. It's not by trying your hardest. It's only by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that you're saved. Having that faith, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, that's it. Only way to heaven. Only one way. Only one book. But there are millions of false teachings out there, false religions, false doctrines. So please study and understand that no matter how nice your church is, your pastor, whatever the case is, if they're not using a King James Bible, and if you're not using a King James Bible, there's no truth. You have to have the truth. That's how God made it. Take care. God bless. And I pray that this really opens your eyes.